At one point during Jesus' ministry, he had sent the disciples out to do all the miracles and all the wonders that he was doing. He gave them the authority. But at one point, there happened to be a man who was possessed. The possessed man was not able to be exercised and the disciples went to Jesus and said, why couldn't we do this? Why were we not able to do this? And Jesus said, how long will I be with you, you of little faith? How long am I going to be with you? But I tell you that only through prayer and fasting are some of these demons able to be driven out. During the reign of Cyrus, Daniel was in Babylon. In Daniel, in the, cha the 10th chapter, it describes a period of time where there was looming war. There was a time where there was a threat to the people. Remember, Daniel and all the Israelites were brought into exile into Babylon. He was already captive. But because he remained faithful, not only did Daniel defeat any of his enemies that tried to bring him harm, Remember, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were all thrown into the fiery furnace, and none of them met death until it was time. And at this one time, Daniel began to pray. He understood Jesus' words, even though he lived a very long time before Jesus was alive, the theory, the idea, the theology was sound. Because what Daniel did was he went before the Lord and he fasted. He didn't eat any tasty things, the scripture says. He didn't eat nothing and he prayed continually. For 21 days he prayed. Well, Father, there's stuff that I've been praying for for years and I haven't got an answer yet. Well, here's the difference. Daniel was a man that feared God, believed God, and believed in God. And he was so serious about receiving that answer that he prayed and fasted nonstop for 21 days. Now during that time, God had answered his prayer on the first day. You must understand that the first day that Daniel started praying and fasting and praying those intercessions the first day that prayer was answered. 
And through that intercession, God always uses his creation to do his work. He sent Gabriel with the answer. The, art, the angel Gabriel was sent to Daniel with that answer. But there was a spirit over the land of Persia named the Prince of Persia, a demon that was powerful, a demon that had his authority over the land. And he met Gabriel and engaged him in battle and fought him for over 20 days, hindering the answer to that prayer. And on the 21st day, God sent Michael to go and defeat the prince of Persia, thus letting Gabriel go through to answer that prayer. You see, Daniel believed God, and he believed in God. And he didn't even have what we have. He didn't have Pentecost. He didn't have the resurrection. He didn't have the tomb. He didn't have the nativity. He didn't have any of the things that we have today. And yet, this man was something special. This man not only was able to do these things, but he also was able to prophesy what was going to happen in the future, during our time, during our future time. And that's why the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation is so closely together. You see, we who are the faithful, we who believe in Christ, we also have a spirit that's looming over us. There's a spirit of deceit, a spirit of confusion, a spirit of darkness that looms over especially our country. <coughs> this country has had a spirit of delusion over it for many, many years. We're so confused about who we are. And I'm not even talking about the hot button topics that's going on right now. I'm talking about Christians not even knowing what their faith is. If you question your faith, you are in a big load of trouble, especially if you have children. You do everything you can and you do every prayer possible in order for you to get to the knowledge and understanding because the only gift that you can give your children is to teach them what faith is. I'm not talking about communion. I'm not talking about baptism. I'm not talking about confession. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about pure, simple, unadulterated faith. And all the things that go on in our marriages, all the things that we fight with daily, if we actually took serious our faith, and we went to God through prayer and fasting, we would not lose. Today we have ten lepers, right? The first time we see Jesus encountering lepers, he encounters one or two, right? He even touches them. But these ten guys, you got to remember that Jesus is heading towards his crucifixion. It's only a few months before Jesus is found going before Pilate and being sentenced to the cross. It's only a few months from now, this time where he encounters the lepers. And they come up to Jesus, mustering up as much faith as they have possible. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of David, have mercy on us. Go. Show yourselves to the priest. That's all Jesus said. Again, Jesus uses whatever is at his disposal in order to show his glory. He uses people, he uses people in order to give, bring his glory to his kingdom. And all ten of these men, they turn around and they head towards going to, going to show themselves to the priests. Remember, leprosy, what these people had, there's still no cure for. There's nothing that can cure leprosy. You can slow it down, but there's still no cure. And in order for you to be cured, you had to have a miracle. 
But God left a provision in his law in order for people to go before the priests and show themselves because God worked his miracles throughout the time from the law all the way up to Christ and all the way up to now. And as those ten men were going, they found themselves healed. But only one guy looked at himself and said, oh, I've been healed. And he turned around. Now remember, it specifically says that this man was a Samaritan. And the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. And all through the scriptures, the scriptures show us that there are people that were even Jews, that were even Christians, that were receiving God's favor because of their faith. How much more faith should we have knowing Christ? Remember the centurions? Remember this woman with the flow of blood? Go forth, Jesus says, right? Go forth, your faith has made you whole. Right? By your faith, you have become whole. This man was healed. This man found a healing, but it wasn't until he came back and glorified God that he was made whole. There's a difference. He was healed of his physical malady, but it wasn't until he turned around that he was healed of his spiritual one. That's what really matters. That's what really is the essence of everything that we have about our faith. It doesn't matter what we believe in. It matters what we believe in who we believe in. We believe in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was the thing that made the difference between these ten men, and obviously the rest of them were Jews, and this man was a Samaritan. And St. Paul, in the letter to the Colossians, he writes them and he gives them instructions, right? He gives them instructions on how to live. He gives them instructions that we shouldn't be using foul language. We shouldn't be having adultery. We shouldn't be doing all the things that we're doing in order for us to be divided from Christ. And then we're doing all those things, and then we go to God and say, have mercy on me, O Lord. Restore my marriage. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Heal my children. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Heal me, heal me. Do this, do this. But yet we don't praise God. We don't glorify God and we don't take seriously our faith because we don't go before God and humble ourselves and say to God, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, and I'm going to bring about something and I'm going to make sure that my prayer is heard. And I want to make sure that the angels of heaven will come and deliver me from whatever it is that is mal that has me in malady. But we have to go before God in faith. We have to go before God in sincerity. And we have to go before God by fasting. Why do you think the church describes fasting? Why do you think the church ascribes fasting? Why do you think the church has fasting as a certain tool for us to be able to get closer to God? But yet, we have people that come along and they want to question every single thing about the faith. They want to question every single thing about what 2,000 years of martyrdom and 2,000 years of blood, sweat, and tears has brought about. How, do you think that the men and women that went before God, that went before their martyrdom, that they questioned their faith? Today, we celebrate one of an interesting saint, and I actually had a conversation with a very close friend of mine about St. John the Hut Dweller. St. John the Hut Dweller at one point was from a very wealthy family. And he decided he was going to forgo all his wealth and he was going to go to the monastery and spend most of his years there. And at one point, he was tempted to go back home and receive all the wealth that his family had. Now at that time, his family did not believe in God. They weren't Christians. And I guarantee that they were angry. And I've known many people that their children go to the monastery, their children go to become priests because they have some sort of enlightened moment. And they go before God and the family's angry because they've been separated from their child. But this man, 
St. John the hut dweller, he goes to his family's home. And they were very wealthy because they had a big court. And he set up a hut inside the court. He didn't dress well. He basically was starving himself. And the question was, is why would this guy go to this place in front of his family and make his family suffer seeing him there? Well, the simple answer was, is his family didn't even recognize him. His family, his mother and father, didn't even know who he was. But yet, he was there praying. He was there fasting. And he was there for years, giving whatever he had to the people that were poor in that area. And then, through prayer and fasting, God gave him a gift to let him know his time was almost come. And at that moment, he went and approached his mother and father. And he said, Mother and Father, I am here. I've been outside of your gates. I have been praying for you. For all those years, after he received the temptation from Satan to go home and take his place back, he decided that was his moment to go home and defeat Satan by praying and fasting. And through that prayer and fasting, his mother and father found salvation. His mother and father found faith, but it wasn't until years and years later. Can you imagine if this guy questioned the things of the faith? Can you imagine if this guy questioned prayer, questioned faith, questioned why he was suffering, questioned all the things that were going on in his life? His simple goal was to glorify God, and through glorifying God, his mother and father were able to join him in eternity. Imagine if we did the same for our wives and our children. Imagine if we did the same for our children that are struggling in this spirit of delusion, in this spirit of confusion. If we fasted and prayed for the people that are so confused in this world to have clarity. And trust me when I tell you, one of the things that St. Paul talks about is idolatry because it is covetousness. Because a lot of times, we have seen so many people in our culture confused about who they are, what they are, and everything that goes along with it. And I tell you, if you are questioning what God created you to be, that is your idol, and that is something that you need to pray about, because that is something for you to not do and question who God created you to be. When God creates, he makes no mistakes. When God creates, he does nothing on accident. And everything that we go through and everything that we have and every struggle that we have is meant to do one thing, and that is to glorify God and glorify God alone. And if we have to go through those moments of confusion and sin and desperation for us to see clarity, it is worth whatever the price is in order for God to bring us back to him. But it's not without the people that love you praying and fasting for you. Because trust me when I tell you, and I've told you this before, I pray for every single one of you in this room. Even the people that have never been here before, I pray that God will allow whoever walks through that door to have a moment of clarity and faith. Because God knows who's coming, even though I don't. But the people that I do know your name, I pray for you every single day. I pray for you every single day. And at first, when I first found myself gaining all the weight that I had gained, when I got sick a couple years ago, when I got that blood clot in my leg, I questioned things. I was like, what is going on, Lord? I love you. What's going on? Why are you allowing these things to happen to me? I question. And throughout all that time, I started gaining weight. I had pain. I had suffering. And nonetheless, I refused to give up 
my time here in church and I kept on coming, but trust me, it wasn't without me questioning things along the way. And then it came up to a point where I happened to have, and I use this word loosely, a chance encounter with this woman in Zephyr Hills that told me the way you're going to lose weight is you're going to stop eating meat and you're going to stop eating cheese and you're going to stop eating sugar and you're going to stop eating all the things that you love that you probably love. And guess what she described for me? A fast. And therefore, I have been fasting for the last three months from meat and cheese. Now, I'm not telling you this to get any kudos from anybody. I am telling you this, that God used that blood clot in my leg when my oldest son graduated from college and used the 200 pounds that I gained in weight and used all the pain and suffering to bring me to that woman in order for me to come to the place where I am praying and fasting all the time so I can pray and fast for you and for myself. Because <clears throat> trust me when I tell you, my wife has witnessed this, the suffering and the torment and the things that I've gone through mentally these last couple months has been hell on me. And I have fought and fought and fought with so many different things. And that includes with sexual stuff. That includes with all the different fears and doubts and everything that goes along with it. And I will confess it right now that I have struggled with all the things that everybody has struggled with more now that I have been fasting than any other time in my life. But you know what? When God brings the archangel Michael or whoever it is, I want to be humble enough to say, I, I'm not worthy to have archangel Michael come to my aid. I would be happy with some simple homeless man helping me because it could be him. That when I finally break through that thing, that God will bring me to a new place of understanding and a new place of faith. Because that's what we need in this world. We need to have a faith that goes beyond understanding. When we receive the Eucharist, we must understand that that is the body and blood of Christ. Any question, you need to go back to God and say, bring me clarity, Lord, because I need to understand and I need to teach my children what it is important in this life because the only gift that you can give your children is faith. Because once you're gone, guess who's going to take over the world unless you have taught them the way to go. Let us glorify the name of the Lord today and worship and praise his name and trust God for every single thing that you go through. Because whatever it is, it may be 20 years before you get an answer. Because trust me when I tell you, God will answer your prayer. Whether it be yes, whether it be no, or whether it be wait. God will answer your prayer. Our faith is something of perseverance. Our faith is something of wonder. Our faith is something that leads us to death. So we can live forevermore. Let us glorify and praise the name of the Lord today. Amen. Amen.